Good morning. As we read chapters 11 through 13 of Job today, we begin with Zophar's first conversation, or his first speech to to uh, Job, and and uh, you know he he starts out: Should a multitude of words go unanswered, and should your babble put others to silence when you mock and stuff? And and you know he's he's kind of you know well I'm just going to he says this is Zophar says you Job say this: My conduct is pure; I am clean in God's sight. And then, oh, that God would speak and open his lips and he would tell you the secrets of wisdom. You know, so I mean, so far as, you know, he, he's saying to Job, you know, you claim your innocence and you, you want God to speak. You want God to um, have a conversation with you and tell you what you've done wrong. Um, and then he kind of switches, can you find these things out from God? Um, you know, and he's, He's uh, using some, I don't know, you know, the, the theology or the, you know, the thought of God, the speaking to God that way, and and he's he's trying to get Job to admit or to see that you have to be guilty, you have to have sinned, you have to have, you have to be, you know, guilty of something great in order that God would punish you this much, you know, and and. You know, he's, he's going on and he says, If he passes through and, and imprisons and assembles for judgment, who can hinder him? For he knows those who are worthless and he sees iniquity. You know, a stupid, and then he says, A stupid person will get understanding when a wild ass is born. But, you know, so he's, Zophar is, is you know, he's just, he's accusing Job of, of something and not being willing to admit, you know, and, you know, he's, he's saying, you know, we can listen to you talk all day long and you can possess your innocence all day long, but we know you must have sinned. You, we know you must be uh, something, you know. And, you know, if iniquity, he says, if, if iniquity is in your hand, put it far away. Don't let wickedness reside in you. And, you know, it's, he's, you know in some ways he's calling for Job to, to repent of his sinful nature, whatever it might be that Job has has done according to Zophar and these others. My camera stand is not working; it's sitting there wrong. But anyway, you know that uh, he's he's just telling Job, you know that that God sees you, God knows you, God knows that you are a sinful person, and and you need to you need to admit it, you know, basically. And then chapter twelve, uh, Job kind of. You know, he, he speaks back and he says, no doubt you are the people and wisdom will die with you. You know, you, you, you got all the answers, you know, and, and so often in life, you know, this is kind of our response to someone else or, you know, we know how they should live their lives and we know what they should do. And, and Job is saying that, you know, that, you know, yeah, you know, you know what's right, you know, everything, but, but he says, verse two, three, but I have understanding as well. I am not inferior to you. I mean, you know, he's saying, I know about God, and I know that God knows who I am, and I am confident that God knows I'm not a sinner. But yet he says in verse 4, I am a laughingstock to my friends. I who called upon God, and he answered me, a just and blameless man, I am a laughingstock. He says, those at ease, those who have, you know, no problems, you know, have contempt for my misfortune, you know, and, and sometimes we do that. I mean, we, I mean, when someone has bad things happen to them, I mean, we, we feel that, um, I don't, we don't feel contempt for them. We, we feel compassion for them. And, 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 and Job is saying to his friends, this is, I mean, I need to have compassion. I need to have understanding, not accusations and finger pointing. You know, and the tents of robbers are at peace, and those who provoke God are secure. You know, and you know he's he's saying, you know, the other people that would deserve God's punishment are are getting by, you know, or whatever. But uh, he's he, he's kind of using some sarcasm here, you know, just just with his with his friends, and says, you know, who brings God into their hand? You know, I mean. It's kind of, 
you're giving yourself more power than you deserve or, or saying that, you know, you're better than others, but, but also having that, the ability to see others' faults, even though they can't see their own fault, pretty much, you know, and, but, uh, so Job, Job kind of goes on with his, you know, refuting Zophar's comments again and everything too, and, you know, continues to, to plead his innocence. And in chapter 13, you know, Job says, my eye has seen all this, my ear has heard it, what, what you know, I know, I'm not inferior to you but I would speak to the Almighty, you know. Job would like to have a conversation with God and and de- and plead his case with God. That's what he says. I, I would desire to argue my case with God. As for you, you whitewash with lies. You are all worthless physicians. You're not helping me at all, he says, you know. This, you know, and I mean, Job is trying to figure this out and make sense of it, you know, and, and his, his friends, so-called friends, you know, are they, I mean, how, how close the friends are they when they, you know, when they, you know, they're not listening to Job. They're, they continue to argue against him rather than support him. I mean, the first seven days they sat there in silence, you know, their, their presence was there. And, and then when they begin to speak, is when they start to put their 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 feet progress, uh, in their mouths, so to speak, that way. But you know, Job says, "As physicians, you're worthless. You're not you're not doing one bit of good." And sometimes I think we're guilty of that too. I mean, you know, we we mean well when we talk to somebody. We understand. We have empathy for what's going on, but we don't. We don't have the answers, but yet we try to have the answers. And, you know, verse 5, he says in chapter 13, if you would only keep silent, that would be your wisdom. You know, knowing when to speak and when not to speak. You know, the, I mean, it's, um, you know, when, when you were sitting with me, he said that, you know, basically that was comforting, that was supportive. But now you're speaking and you're not doing any good. You know, so then verse 6, again, he's going to plead with them. He's going to say, hear now my reasoning and listen to the pleading of my lips. And when you speak falsely for God, when you speak falsely for God. I mean, this is this is a, a challenge. I mean, you know, that's, I mean, as a pastor, I get up on Sunday mornings and I preach a sermon. Or like this right now, I'm just, you know, doing a Bible study. And... Uh, I, I can't put words in God's mouth. You know, I can't, I I need to read the Bible. We need to read the Bible and we use the Bible to interpret the Bible. And and, and I read comments that, that others, biblical scholars have, have published and things that way. But we need to not put words into God's mouth. You know, we can't, we can't say that, well, God says it's okay if we do this because, you know, no, if God doesn't say it's okay, you know, it's, you know, we don't have more wisdom and understanding than God. We don't have the rights to change God's laws or any of that. So, you know, when you speak falsely of God and speak deceitfully for him, he said, will you show partiality toward him? Will you plead the case for God? Or can you deceive him as one person deceives another? You know, and, you know, trying to deceive someone else, trying to, you know, pull the wool over their eyes, or trying to get them to believe a lie. You know, the, a lie is a lie no matter how many people believe it. And the truth is the truth no matter how many people absolutely won't believe it. We, we know those things to be true. We hold that, you know, right in our, in our hearts and in our minds. But yet, you know, there are so many people in the world that, that try to deceive others and try to get others to believe things that aren't what they should be. You know, so, so I mean, Job kind of lamb blasts his friends here somewhat with sarcasm, but also with with the reality uh, that, that you and I um, can't put words in God's mouth. You and I don't know more than God, and, and we need to... Um, be careful that way. And so Job continues to plead his case before his friends. 
And he says, I will defend myself before you and before God that I am not, I am not guilty. You know, I, you know, and, and, and his, you know, it's, um, you know, he says, verse 23, how many are my iniquities and my sins? Make me know my transgressions. Why do you hide your face and count me as your enemy? I mean, here he's speaking directly to God. He's, he's asking God to, to hear his case, to, to, what did I do, you know? And, um, and all of that. So he ends up this, this verse, the last verse of chapter 13, one wastes away like a rotten thing like a garment that is moth-eaten. You know, and in our lives, our lives are finite. You know, they, we're gonna, we're all gonna die at some point in time, and Job knows that. But, but he also knows and believes in God, and he, and he trusts in God explicitly. And so often in our world today, when something bad happens to us, we blame God or others blame God, or we ask, what must they have done that God punished them so greatly? And it's, I think the book of Job is one of those, one of those learning tools for us that, that God doesn't punish us as we live here on this earth. It's, I remember years ago when, when Hurricane Katrina hit, you know, well, that was God punishing the United States for its sins. Well, why would God punish just that area and not the whole area? And, you know, if there's drought or if there's this or that, or somebody gets hail or not hail, you know, and, you know, and I had somebody tell me one time he hadn't had hail on his land for, he never had hail, hail crop because God was protecting and blessing him. And, and um, I, I, I don't see God working that way in the world. Uh, God isn't, making hail fall on somebody and not on somebody else because of that person's goodness or that person's badness. Nature runs its course and and um, God set things in motion and, and the world continues that way. And um, I'm sure that God's heart breaks um, when catastrophes fall that way. Um, but the world isn't a perfect place and we all know that. God's love for us is perfect. And in that we rejoice.